in the summer of 1960. I bought a copy of Radio Electronics, the first I had ever seen. It was June 1960. It was hot in Texas, and I actually went into the drugstore to get a banana split. I didn't have enough money for that and this magazine, but I made the right decision. I skipped the banana split and I bought Radio Electronics. In that issue was an article that without putting too fine a point on it, substantially changed my life. It had to do with a twin-coupled amplifier that Radio Electronics had published in a previous issue and a cons uh, set of updates. Well, I liked the article. The author was Norman Crowhurst. And partly for that reason, and partly because I liked the magazine, I subscribed. A few months later, I received an issue containing this high power for the twin coupled amplifier story. I also read it and was fascinated by the steps that people were taking in the time to improve the fidelity of tube amplifiers. As a result, I was looking for a way to get the original article which had actually appeared back in November of 1957. Well, about the same time that this issue arrived, the state of Texas, uh, the library of the state of Texas, sponsored a bookmobile program, which came to my small central Texas town. And a friendly librarian told me that I could get back uh, copies of magazines through the state library and they would in fact make copies for you for a penny a page. So I got a copy of the original twin coupled amplifier article. By now I was well versed in Norman Crowhurst and his uh, exposition of the advances being made in high fidelity. And as a result, I began what turned out to be about a 10-year quest to find out more and more about amplifiers, tube amplifiers. And the basic problem came about because in the day, this was the standard output circuit for an amplifier. It consisted of a push-pull stage, and the dilemma was the transformers of the time were not very good. They only would go up to about 25 kilohertz. They called it kilocycles in those days. The speakers weren't very good, but also there was a problem with the tubes. You could use triodes, like shown here, in which case you were stuck with low power. Low power meant that you couldn't turn the volume up very far without getting distortion, but at least at low volume you got pretty good fidelity. If you turned the volume up, the amplifier would distort because the tube would go into cutoff or saturation. The transformer would saturate, and if you tried to fix that problem by increasing the current through the tubes, you would wind up with so much DC flowing through the primary that the magnetic characteristics of the transformer were, were all messed up. You got flat spots on the hysteresis curve. Well, anyway, all of this I didn't know at the time. Of course, I knew everything. I was 15 years old, so uh, it was at that time in life when I knew everything. But I later learned a lot more and knew a lot less. And eventually I realized that this was an area where there could be a lot of work, but actually a lot of work had already been done. In fact, one of the things that people had tried is replacing these tubes with tetrodes, pentodes, 
and beam power tubes. It worked to, to an extent. The trouble was that if you replace them with tetros, you get what was called the kink problem. If you watched my video on how tubes work, you know that tetrodes have a kink in their characteristic curve, and that produces substantial distortion. The nice thing about the, replacing the, these with tetrodes or pentodes is it reduced the drive requirements. So now you could get higher power out of this system, but because of the distortion, it really didn't do you any good. So eventually, I was led to a design that had first appeared in Wireless World back in April of 1947. And this was a design by a gentleman named Williamson. What he had done was in essence redesign the circuit, the transformer, the driver stage, and had put together in one design what was in effect a good high quality power amplifier that produced very good output at very low distortion. Well, the Williamson design began to catch on. And so what I propose to do in this video, and I think I'm going to have to make it in two parts, is start by explaining exactly what it was that Williamson had done and why it made such a big difference. That's probably as far as I'm going to get in part one because I am going to have to first go back and do a little bit of background about uh, things like transformers, feedback, and, and other things that I hope won't bore everybody, but frankly to understand the advances of the, of the Williamson amplifier. You need to understand not only what the drawbacks of transformers of the day were, but what it was that Williamson did to redesign those output transformers and second, how you can use feedback to improve the characteristics of an amplifier. So we'll talk about some of those basics first, and then we'll move on, talk about the Williamson, wrap up part one. And then in part two, I hope to go on and talk about two other major advances. One, the ultralinear amplifier, which was in essence an improvement on the Williamson that allowed you to use tetrodes in the uh, a new kind of tetrode. Actually, it was called the kinkless tetrode, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, as well as the idea of cathode loading, that is, transferring some of the power that goes to the speaker, not all through the plate, but some through the cathode. Those were the major advances that had taken place up till about the time that I got into this in the early 60s. By the late 60s, hi-fi had really taken off, and maybe I'll wrap up with a, with a little tragedy that caused me to kind of move away from this area in, in the late 60s. One of the first things that Williamson looked at was the problem of the output transformer. and. Part of the problem with a transformer is that the inductance actually changes depending on how hard it's being driven. And the reason is that the flux, that is the magnetic force that's flowing through the core, is not directly or linearly proportional to the voltage or the current through the, through the winding. And one uh, problem that that presents is at low outputs, the inductance of the core, or the inductance of the primary, is very low. At maximum output, it's quite a bit higher. And of course, at this point, this is its maximum inductance. You can't operate at this point because the core is saturated. You have to operate a little bit below the maximum inductance point. So basically, you're operating between A and B. Well, as you can see, not only is the inductance varying, but it's varying in a nonlinear way. 
So he attempted to address that through a variety of means, a lot of which I'm going to skip over. And, and in fairness, I'm going to be skipping a lot of important technical points in order to bring about the overall impression of what the Williamson amplifier did for high fidelity. But one of the things that he did was breaking the transformer up into multiple windings. And I'll show you uh, a response, uh, a transformer that was produced by Stancor in a minute that met the specs that uh, Williamson put forth in his uh, article. And by the way, a major part of the appendix is devoted to exactly how you would wind this transformer. But nonetheless, that's the first issue that he addressed. The second issue was the question of which tube to use in the output. Now one of the things that Williamson noticed right away was that the, the receiving tubes of the day, that is the tubes that were being used in radios, were simply inadequate. They couldn't put out the kinds of current and the, the kinds of power that you really needed to do a good job. Uh, he estimated, and these have been borne out by uh, uh, studies later, that you needed between 10 and 20 watts of power to basically fill a room with the kind of sound that you needed to produce high fidelity results. Well, you couldn't get 10 to 20 watts out of the receiving tubes. So he looked at transmitting tubes. Well, there were lots of good transmitting tubes, including a lot of, of tetrodes that produce a lot of power and don't need a huge amount of drive to produce that power. The trouble is tetrodes have a screen grid and the screen grid conducts current. When you look at the characteristics of a, a tetrode, you see why he decided not to go with at least a tetrode connection. Here is what a tetrode connected, uh, what a tetrode connected as a tetrode, what its characteristics look like. You notice this big kink in the characteristic. Well, he first considered using a new type of tube that had just come out that was called a beam power tube. Now, I talked more about mean power tubes in a previous video, so I won't go into too much of it, but the way that a mean power tube works is it's essentially a tetrode, but it, perform, it, it forms a virtual cathode between the screen grid and the plate. The virtual cathode is formed by these beam forming plates. That helps a lot but it doesn't really solve the entire, the entire problem. In fact, the tube that he chose was the KT-66. KT actually in the day stood for kinkless tetrode. And you notice that it's called a beam pentode, but actually the uh, suppressor grid doesn't actually, uh, doesn't actually use a, uh, a grid. It actually uses a virtual cathode. But, once again, this still didn't solve the problem. So, what did he, uh, what did he do? Well, he looked at using this tube, but operating it as a triode. If you operate a KT-66 as a pentode, you get the very high plate resistance and high uh, mutual conductance that, oh, as well as high amplification factor. But you can also operate it as a triode, and that's what's shown in this lower diagram. And the nice thing about operating as a triode is you have very low distortion. So, in his final circuit, he chose a KT-66 operated as a triode. Here's the circuit that he picked, and I'm going to zoom in, and in case this looks a little strange to you, it's because 
He has the power supply drawn over here on the right. Normally it's down at the bottom. So in other words, here's where the uh, where, where the uh, speaker would connect and the uh, the voltage from the uh, power supply connects here and here. But let's look at this triode connected. You notice that what he has done is inserted a resistor between the screen grid and the plate. What that does is effectively makes the tube operate as a triode. So what you now have is a push-pull high-power triode amplifier. Some other things that he did that helped to make this uh, useful was he developed a fairly complicated biasing network, but it had the advantage that you could balance. In other words, this control allows you to balance the drive to both tubes, and this control allows you to control the total current, while this control allows you to balance the tubes. In other words, by moving this control, you suppose, for example, that each tube is consuming 20 milliamps. That means a total of 40. That's set with this control. But then suppose that you discover that while there's 40 milliamps total, this one is 25 and this one is only 15. Well, then you could set this control to balance the two so that they would be 20 milliamps each. Similarly, by adjusting this control, you can balance the drive. This is the driver circuit. And the nice thing about the Williamson amplifier was because he used the KT66 beam to pentodes as triodes, he had enough gain and enough power dissipation or power output that the driver stage did not have to operate at the high voltages that earlier attempts had operated. Without operating at those high voltages, you could use ordinary tubes in this stage. Finally, you'll notice that he has a tube that's used as a phase inverter. That's shown here, and that converts a single-ended drive signal into a plate signal across this resistor and a cathode signal across this resistor. The cathode signal is fed to this driver. The plate signal is fed to that driver. Finally, he interconnected the first and second stage, that is the, the inverter stage, the phase inverter, is direct coupled. Because he was able to use lower voltages, you can get away with this. Ordinarily, if you had four or five hundred volts on the plate of this tube, there's no way you could operate this tube with a direct connection. But because he is able to operate this cathode at a fairly high potential and the overall circuit at a fairly low potential, he's able to direct connect this to this. And the advantage of that is he is able to achieve a yet further uh, reduction in distortion because there is very little phase shift across the frequency range. Partly because of this direct connection, there's very little phase shift in this circuit. One drawback, however, of the Williamson circuit, or actually of the Williamson transformer, was, at least in the early days, they were so much better than the other transformers that designers had trouble using them in a stable way. The transformer of the day before Williamson would probably operate up to around 25 kilocycles. The Williamson transformer would operate to up to around 300 kilocycles. And as a result, there was a fair amount of instability, particularly at the higher frequencies.
And so it was very common for uh, home-built Williamson amplifiers of the day to go into inaudible oscillation. That is, oscillation that was so high in frequency that the, uh, the user or the builder couldn't hear it. And without good test equipment, the, uh, you couldn't find that. We'll talk about uh, an addition that was made. Actually, the performance of these amplifiers was substantially degraded deliberately with a resistor-capacitor combination. But the, uh, to, to get rid of some of that high-frequency uh, oscillation, one other problem about the high-frequency oscillation was it didn't often occur when the amplifier was sitting sta stably with no input. It would occur at some input levels, but not at others. And so even if you hooked up your oscilloscope and, and you had a good enough oscilloscope in those days to go out to 500 kilohertz or so, you still wouldn't see it because it only would occur when a certain level of signal was being fed through the amplifier. This, by the way, is still a problem and always has been and will be, even in modern solid-state amplifiers, but we won't go into that. The thing we will talk about next, though, is feedback. It's long been known that if you take a portion of the output signal and feed it back to the input, you can produce a variety of effects on the overall circuit. If the feedback is negative, that is, if the phase shift from input to feedback signal is 180 degrees, then the feedback signal subtracts from the input signal. Therefore, the gain of the amplifier goes down, but you get a great many other benefits. The distortion goes down dramatically. The output impedance of the amplifier goes down dramatically and the input impedance of the amplifier goes up. So the main thing that Williamson was looking for with feedback was to improve the distortion, but he was also able to lower the output impedance, which helped him a bit when he got to the uh, speaker manufacturers trying to design speakers to work with the Williamson amplifier, which the original Williamson amplifier was, was designed for a 15 ohm speaker. Manufacturers eventually settled on 16 ohms, but basically it's the same thing. I'm not going to talk much about feedback. There is an excellent uh, set of YouTube videos by a, an MIT professor on feedback and feedback control systems. Uh, he does it far better than I, but it runs 25 hours, and I'm certainly not going to go into that here. Nonetheless, Feedback was an important part of the Williamson amplifier, so let's look at how Williamson did that. Williamson decided that to do an effective job, or to do the most effective job, of controlling the distortion of the amplifier, the feedback would have to be as large a loop as possible. That is, from as far in the output as possible to take the feedback signal, and the feedback signal needed to be fed back to as early a point as possible. Well, it would be possible to feed back to the grid resistor, but that causes problems that we won't talk about having to do with interaction with the input signal. So what he chose to do was feed back to the cathode of the input stage. So he placed a resistor in the cathode causing this stage to, to already have some feedback due to what is called current feedback that is a result of an unbypassed cathode resistor. But he enhanced that effect by bringing a signal through this resistor off of the output transformer. This had the additional advantage not only of making the feedback path very, very long, but of including the transformer and its nonlinearities in the feedback. The result was that Williamson was able to produce a very, very low distortion amplifier. This is the plot of the particular amplifier that Williamson describes in the article. The 
scale at the bottom is the input in volts, that is RMS, the scale along the y-axis is the output volts, RMS, therefore this line shows power from half a watt, this is 4, 5 watts, and all the way up to 15 watts. And then down below is the distortion with and without feedback. The uh, dashed line is without feedback. Notice how the distortion begins to increase substantially even at very low uh, input voltage levels and gets really bad as it approaches maximum power. Whereas with feedback, the distortion remains very, very low. And by the way, this distortion, this is a half a percent, okay, 0.5% distortion. So this is 0.4, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 0.4, So the, all the way out to its maximum, the total distortion of the amplifier with feedback remains below 0.2%. This was a revolution in its time. You, no one had produced a, an amplifier like this. And people who heard this amplifier, because it had virtually no phase shift, it had extremely wide frequency range. Remember, the transformer would go out to 300 kilohertz. The amplifier itself would go out to 100 kilohertz, though, as I pointed out, sometimes that had to be limited to keep the uh, uh, oscillation down, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we look at an actual commercial application. But nonetheless, the, the Williamson amplifier was uh, basically too good to be true, almost. It was so far advanced in its day that everyone jumped on it, and transformer manufacturers began building transformers, tube manufacturers began building tubes for it, Basically, it became the gold standard in high-fidelity amplifiers. Here is a page from the Stancor Transformers catalog of the early 1950s showing the transformers that they had developed for use in the Williamson high-fidelity amplifier. And they even produced a set of chassis that you could buy that allowed you to build the amplifier, including a pre-amplifier if you wish to build that. But the main thing about the uh, Williamson is it didn't just revolutionize the circuit, it revolutionized the components in the circuit. Tubes as well as transformers and other components began to be optimized to these new higher standards. And it was the beginning of the hi-fi revolution. Well, of course, it wasn't long until the Williamson became popular, not just in Britain, where it was developed, but also in the United States. Of course, there were also a number of do-it-yourself articles that began to appear in the, uh, in the hobbyist magazines, and one of those is this article by a designer for the Acro Products. Acro Products were actually the uh, British transformer company that produced the transformer for the Williamson amplifier. In other words, they were the ones that actually worked with Williamson to produce, and the Acro Products is the uh, original Williamson transformer, although because Williamson did not patent the transformer, it was easy for other manufacturers to copy it. So, at any rate, this particular article appeared in, the, in a 1959 edition of Radio and Television News. Yes, December 1959 edition. And, of course, the transformer that they are specifying for the output is the Acro Products. But, uh, this is the preamplifier. And then here is the amplifier itself. And once again, you see the more or less uh, 
standard form of unbypassed cathode resistor in the primary, biasing arrangement to control the, uh, the bias to the two, uh, the, uh, plate, the quiescent current in the two output tubes, and a feedback to that unbypassed cathode. So this was the state of the Williamson amplifier until an improvement came along. That improvement was, someone began to ask the question, well, if you're going to use tetrodes here anyway, is there some way to use them in a tetrode mode rather than in this triode mode? And if so, can you do it in a way that doesn't produce the distortion, or at least doesn't produce as much distortion as the typical tetrode outputs? But I'm going to save that story for part two. I hope you enjoy this part, and if you do, I hope you'll uh, stay tuned for part two. It might be a, a few days before I can get that put together and posted. But nonetheless, uh, this, I hope, will be the start of a, a series of videos on Hi-Fi, particularly tube amplifiers.